Okay, um, welcome to the second seminar of the Spark series. We have two very distinguished speakers. So we have uh, Dr. Sarah Hardcastle, who will speak mainly about her research. Sarah has been working in various places around the globe. Uh, Bristol, I think, right? Uh, uh, Australia, uh, Dublin, and now she has uh, been an associate professor at this university since last July. So it will be interesting to hear her research around health interventions and impacts on uh, uh, sport and physical activity. And then we have a presentation by Dr. James Rampant uh, on uh, the diary studies uh, on uh, primary appraisal, emotional exhaustion and turnover novel uh, intentions. So this is um, a study that has been already presented in a conference and is has been submitted, I think, for a peer review article. So it will be interesting to follow this research. And uh, I leave you now with Sarah. Okay, thanks all for coming. Um, not many of you know me um, by now, so I'm just going to start off with something a bit random and a bit strange, funny, if you don't mind. So this is the love of my life, George. Uh, I've got him as a pup in Australia, he's moved from Australia to Dublin and back to the UK. Um, but the serious note of this is my answer to the public health inactivity epidemic is dogs on prescription. I think it's, uh, it's the way forward. Uh, just quickly, that's because dog owners do more exercise than gym goers, research has shown this. Um, and most dog owners <coughs> don't see dog walking as a chore, even in bad weather, um, but many kind of don't like going to a gym. That's just a kind of a funny start to the presentation. So moving on then, I'm just going to go through um, some of my broad areas of research focus or expertise. And I'm going to walk you through, I guess, a body of research I've been doing in Australia around cancer survivorship, so promoting physical activity in cancer survivors. <clears throat> so three main strands to my research. Firstly, understanding the process of health behavior change and the factors influencing or hindering uh, exercise engagement. And that's mainly been through formative and qualitative research with consumers. Secondly, uh, complex interventions such as motivation interviewing. Uh, I'm not really gonna get into MI today, but my last work in this area is identifying all the different techniques that comprise MI, which hadn't been done before. And there's 38 different techniques, so hence complex intervention. And then lastly, the design, implementation, evaluation of uh, interventions to improve physical activity, quality of life, um, and health outcomes in various population groups. And most of my work really has been in clinical populations, so cardiac rehab, um, patients at risk in primary care from CBD, and more recently, cancer survivorship, pulmonary hypertension, cystic fibrosis. So to start with the story, so it starts off with consumer engagement in Australia with cancer survivors, trying to understand more about um, their support needs, their barriers, and the factors influencing their uh, activity participation. So the kind of four main themes from this work, uh, first of all, not being the sporty type. So many people don't, don't um, identify as being sporty or athletic. And after the last time they did sport exercise was at school. Uh, this is a real barrier to behavior change, I'm sure you're all aware. Another interesting one was erroneous views about being sufficiently active. So I think a lot of people are quite being busy or busy these days. I'm in Zoom meetings, team meetings, uh, and we feel really busy, but actually that's not being um, active. So that, that can be a problem as well. Often people think being busy is the same as being active. And also poor self-discipline or low levels of motivation was also a barrier among survivors, which is also a common barrier generally in the adult population for exercise. And also a desire for monitoring, support and accountability. And um, with reference to accountability, often people will say Weight Watchers works because of the public weigh-ins, which give, provide a sense of sort of external accountability. So we use this research to really feed into the design of the following interventions. I'm gonna walk you through the WhatsApp and PPARC trials in the following ways. <clears throat> so first of all, the promotion of lifestyle, physical activity, rather than sport or kind of uh, gym-based programs. So focusing on walking, cycling, those kind of things. 
Secondly, to support uh, problems around poor self-discipline, providing a nudge via wearable trackers uh, to help sort of prompt um, further bouts of this activity. Provision of objective feedback to try and overcome these erroneous views about being sufficiently active, again, primarily through the wearable tracker and also through offering back the baseline actigraph assessment data back to participants. And also self-monitoring support, again, primarily through the provision of a wearable tracker, uh, but also in the case of P-Parks through the health coach. This also brings me on to the point about, I think we have an issue, and this is much wider than cancer survivorship, I think we have an issue right now between a mismatch between often what people's exercise preferences are and what we tend to offer them um, in terms of community in interventions. So we reference to cancer survivors, for example, they often prefer home-based exercise, not gym-based. They prefer outdoor exercise rather than indoor, and they prefer to exercise on their own or with one other. And yet, if you think most interventions that we kind of offer tend to be group-based programs, facility-based programs, often at gyms or hospitals, um, and also involving funds. Obviously, after a program's finished, it might require um, including a health club membership, and then the time issues. So a lot of people talk about the time issues involved with traveling to and fro a facility as well as the time involved to do exercise. So for all those reasons, I'm a big fan of home base and have been like that before COVID, whenever I was jumping on the bandwagon uh, for this kind of uh, approach. So the WhatsApp trial was the wearable activity technology and action planning trial in cancer survivors was in colorectal and endometrial cancer survivors in Western Australia. So this was a low intensity intervention. We gave out Fitbit Alter to intervention group, control group, just got um, the booklet. There were two group sessions at a hospital uh, run by myself and Chloe, my PhD student. The group sessions really focused on the risks of inactivity, the benefits of exercise for cancer survivors specifically, um, and also around sort of behavior change and trying to help them with um, have those tools for action planning, goal setting, self monitoring, and so on. And then one phone call followed at week eight. So that was a 12 week intervention. And you'll see there a significant net increase of 66 minutes of MBPA, that's through the Actigraph assessment um, over the 12 weeks. So, pretty promising finding there. And importantly, those changes were maintained at 24 week follow up without any further intervention. So, between 12 weeks and 24 weeks, there was no formal support offered. They did keep their Fitbit alters. Um, so that's the WhatsApp trial showing promise for sort of lower intensity interventions. We also did a WhatsApp process evaluation, which um, I'm sorry to say, I'm just about analyzing just recently, about three or four years overdue. I've just been on my desk for a while. So we did in-depth interviews with the majority of the intervention group, so 23 out of 34 in the intervention group. Um, and the purpose of those interviews really was, was wide ranging, but to look at A, how do they get on with intervention? How was it useful? Was it acceptable? Was it feasible? Um, but also trying to get a handle on why were some people successful and increased their MVPA and some people didn't. So you'll see the graph I've got there, uh, 12, a dozen of them increased their MVPA between T1 and T2 and maintained at T3. Uh, some others um, didn't change at all. Uh, and one person in there increased between T1 and T2, but did not maintain the change. So this was a, a, a way to be able to look at sort of these people and these people and what it helps explain the differences, which often is missed when you're in the reporting of clinical trials, often just look group-based changes. Uh, and this is important to really try and delve into, well, why did it work for some and not others? Uh, and what, you know, what's going on there? How can that speak back to theory and research? So this is under what's submitted at the moment. Uh, there's seven themes altogether. I'm just gonna go through four of the, the main themes with you on this. <clears throat> First of all, the, the sort of most active ingredient that Possum's talked about was the Fitbit. And they talked about it becoming their health coach. So the Fitbit was a very powerful tool, um, particularly self-monitoring. They all talked about self-monitoring and using that and also reviewing their goals um, at the end of the week and seeing whether they need to, to, to do more, um, more bouts of exercise. So the Fitbit was particularly powerful, which is what we hypothesized. 
Secondly, accountability monitoring was interesting. So it was really those who didn't change so well or were less accessible who really focused on accountability, as you might expect, um, they're externally motivated. And the ones who were more successful, although they valued monitoring and support, they were less reliant on sort of um, accountability. So that's kind of in line with self-determination theory. Uh, and commitment, this was um, what I might call a, a sort of foundational theme, if you like, really helped to explain those who were successful and those who weren't. So those who were successful seemed to have a commitment to exercise, and that was really typified by priori prioritizing exercise in their daily schedules and weeks, but also really valuing exercise. It's important for their health, important for their psychological well-being, or important just in terms of lo longevity uh, and sort of... Um, staying fit and healthy as long as possible. Those who were less committed didn't prioritize exercise and tended to play more spontaneous or incidental exercise. And that sort of fits with the next theme. So what I noticed was that those who uh, were more successful did more bouted exercise. So scheduled exercise, they sort of planned it in their week. Uh, and those who didn't perform as well on MVPA did more incidental exercise. So running up about, a stairs that kind of thing so i think that's an important point without getting into lecturing mode with you is that um it worries me when we focus a lot these is on steps and you know just trying to get people to do more because actually the guidelines aren't about steps about moderate to vigorous activity and it looks like incidental exercise will not lead to changes in mvpa uh, so that's kind of important thing from, from that study there's loads more i could talk about this one for an hour but we'll um move on Moving on to the P Parks um, trial, promoting productivity in regional remote cancer survivors. So this became a national um, trial in Australia. I was interested in going after regional remote because they're an underserved population. They're geographically disadvantaged, and they also, those living in regional remote areas also carry a high disease burden, um, high mortality risk, high levels of inactivity, obesity, and so forth. So you can see from the map of Australia. And for those of you who don't know much about Australia, to give you an idea how big it is, I was living over here in Perth, West Australia, and the flying time from Perth to Sydney, like New South Wales, is five hours. So you can get an idea how vast it is. And obviously, apart from anything else, cancer survivors also living in regional remote areas don't have any access to gym facilities anyway, even if they wanted to do that kind of exercise. So these were the survivors we went for. So we recruited for Western Australia, New South Wales, Victoria. I think we had a couple from South Australia, one from Tasmania as well. So that's the study title. So again, you'll see a trend here with the kind of research I'm doing. I'm interested in trying to develop interventions that are scalable, that if deemed successful could be rolled out in practice. So we all know that if we all had a PT dragging us out of bed each morning at five o'clock, we'd all be exercising a lot, right? Uh, but that's not really possible. So this was also a 12-week intervention using Fitbit Charge 2, up to six sessions of telephone health coaching. So it's purely remotely delivered. Um, and again, a booklet uh, with motivational techniques and, and the risks of inactivity and so on. Why is the screen shaking? I don't know why it's shaking. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't really want to get too heavy on you, but again, just to quickly say that both WhatsApp and P-Parts were, were theory-based and they were based on the health action process approach model by Ralph Schwarzer. Um, and in brief, so they were focused on um, <coughs> targeting these risk perceptions so people understand that inactivity is, is a risk factor, focusing on fostering confidence to change, and then also trying to bridge this gap between having the intention to change and then that being carried out in practice so involving action planning and coping planning so these, these are some of the key techniques that we were involved in the um, health coaching and again just to give you a bit of flavor what you look like on the ground so i developed quite a detailed health training script for the health coaches working on the project and this bit here was about increasing risk awareness so we go through a bit about um, the importance of exercise for cancer survivors post-treatment and that they're, they're more likely to die of CVD rather than the cancer. But the good news is they, they can do something about their CVD risk. Um, and then it, it's sort of a good MI style. We'd ask them to sort of interpret that. You know, what do you make of that? Some people don't buy into it. Some people think it's slightly rubbish. So it's good to try and find out 
clarify what they what they take from what you've just kind of um, been sharing with them. That's just one aspect of the health coaching. And again, this is um, a glance at the booklet of one of the action planning sheets that are in there. So I'm sure you all know, so good action planning is, is, it should be as detailed as possible. So we, we would try and um, problems is to do detailed planning in terms of when they're going to exercise, uh, how, who, with, um, and so on. I didn't show you the consort for the WhatsApp, but just um, example one here. So this is P Park. So invited over 500 patients. They were invited through their treating medical surgical oncologist. Um, that was thought to be important in terms of increasing uptake. Sort is important coming from their, their clinician. Um, we recruited 87 to start with, and that's what we needed for the sort of power calculations. The difference between control and intervention group. So intervention, so I mentioned, so Fitbit charge two this time, and I was particularly interested in the charge two because it had heart rate on it. Uh, and one of the issues I had with the old two was it didn't have a heart rate, it just had active minutes. And it was quite difficult to really help people understand what moderate to vigorous activity is we talk about rpe but it's kind of can be a bit flaky um, so we use the carvona method and tried to help people to understand what kind of heart rate range for their age would be appropriate obviously if they're on beta blockers and whatnot it might be different uh, but that was really helpful i think participants knowing what kind of range should be targeting when they're going out and some that really got into that so one lady um she started doing more hilly walks to get her heart rate in the right kind of zone. So that, that seemed to, I haven't analysed the qualitative data on this yet, but um, I think that will come out, the, the helpful element of the heart rate focus. So up to six um, telephone health coaching sessions over 12 weeks, four of these were fixed, you've got the weeks there, and then using a step care approach, those who felt they needed more monitoring support also offered a session at week six um, and week 10. So again, week one was the longest session up to an hour. So I was covering if there are technical issues around um, using the Fitbit, uh, the big focus on MVPA, MVPA over steps or in, in conjunction with steps. Um, and then the whole thing about fostering confidence and creating action plans. And the following follow-up sessions are really all about providing feedback, support, and again, going through coping planning, uh, action planning, goal setting. I think it's really valuable for this was the health coach is able to look at the Fitbit data so they get on the dashboard for each person and see what they'd actually achieved in the last couple weeks objectively. Uh, I think that was really helpful rather than relying on self-report, which people might just um, say they had a good week when they didn't or, or vice versa. So again, I've only just recently analysed this data. T3 is yet to be analysed, but T1, T2, T2 data Again, promising, exciting findings here, significant improvement in intervention group compared to the controls. So I said there are 87 survivors, this time breast and colorectal, similar age profile to the WhatsApp trial. A significant increase of 50 minutes favoring the intervention group. Um, the actual difference, the actual change in intervention group was more like 70 minutes, but unfortunately the controls also increased the MVPA by 19 minutes. Um, so the net effect was 50 minutes. So I'm hoping that was maintained at T3, but um, I haven't looked at the data yet. And I was going to quickly go through um, an oncologist survey that I did. So this was all about, so it, when I was doing the interviews as well with patients, they all say the same thing, that they don't hear the advice from the oncologist about exercise. They just don't hear that, that it's important, that it's a, it's a risk factor going forward. Um, and they say that if they had that information, they, they take on, on board that advice and of course they would do more exercise. So I thought, okay, we need to find out what oncologists think about exercise. What guidelines are they giving, giving out to patients? So what are their attitudes generally towards promotion? So this survey, we ended up um, contacting various oncology societies um, and it was mainly um, Australian, US, Canadian, I think oncologists who, who replied. So 123 in this survey. The survey was based on theory of planned behaviour. I'm not going to go through the modelling with you, just some of the, of the key findings here. So we asked them to open-endedly say what they were recommending to their patients to exercise, and then we looked at whether it matched the guidelines. 
So only just over a third actually were providing recommendations or prescriptions that match the guidelines, which is kind of the first um, interesting finding. We also asked them about their own exercise behavior. So we hypothesized those who were you know, exercising themselves and more likely to promote it would be exercise evangelists. So again, only a quarter um, reported meeting the guidelines. And remember, this is a motivate. This is 123 out of I don't know how many hundreds could have filled out filled out this questionnaire. So these are the ones who are interested. So probably a pretty dismal picture about how many of them are actually act active themselves. Um, and we also found that those who are more active um, were more likely to promote exercise following theory plan behavior kind of modeling. Only 20% provided written information or, or prescriptions. And the main, the main barriers again reported qualitatively from open-ended sponsors uh, with the time issues, uh, access to trained specialists or, or referral pathways. And again, interesting lack of patient interest and motivation. So you've got on the one hand, oncologists saying patients are not motivated to change, they're quite resistant to change, that's why they don't talk to them. And then you've got the patients saying, well, they don't tell me anything, so it's kind of like this. Um, so there's a kind of real divide there between really what's going on here. Patients say they don't hear anything they want to, but oncologists are saying um, patients don't want to hear it. So, yeah, leave that one there. And then just quickly on to the next, so this, this study, I've had funding for this for a year or so, but obviously with COVID hitting them, the funds are in Australia and I'm now left Dublin, I'm here, it's all a bit messy, but I'm hoping to just get this started in 2023, something to find the oncologists um, round and about Sheffield who are willing to get involved with this. So you can see I'm edging closer towards what, what's, what can we do in practice that can, that can be rolled out. So this is a three arm RCT, We'll involve oncologists giving out written prescriptions during routine consults with cancer survivors. Uh, a second arm, just the usual care, which is usually not very much. And a third arm, uh, prescription plus motivational package, including wearable tracker and the same sort of thing I, I was mentioning in sort of the key parts as well. That's about it. So thank you for listening. And if you've got any questions. Good question, Shana. I Look, I haven't done research in cancer survivors yet, really, in the UK. Before I left the UK, I was working more in primary care with patients with CBD risk. So I, the short answer is I can't answer that very well. But I think what I would say is, what I find interesting working in different countries is whatever, whatever country you're in, the same barriers arise. For example, weather. Australians say weather's a problem. You know, they, they, I can tell you, I lived in Perth and they have weather like California. They have, they have excellent weather. So I think wherever you live, you see the same sorts of barriers. So I'm fairly confident to say that a lot of it is motivational. Uh, I think where, wherever, you, wherever you are. Um, so I, I assume that in the interventions in favor of our moment, yes, the most yeah. individual. And this is because most people have a preference for home based and outdoor exercise. Uh, have you considered the case that maybe what it is individual preference, which people may want this because it's the most comfortable thing to do, may not be best thing from the point of well-being, point of mental health. Because in other research projects I have seen, mm -hmm. people actually want to be individual-based, home-based design. But once they switch to group, even if they want to, if they switch to a group set, then other things come into play, which with the social interactions, they have a different uh, different parameters in terms of the benefits of uh, so this is just something to of them in terms of the interventions. Uh, and is that where well, the dog thing also? Uh, well, it's mainly because I just love dogs and obviously as a dog owner, I can testify for well-being benefits. But yes, it's that as well. I mean, I think, you know, 
people who've got dogs might not be the sporty types, but you know, if you've got a dog, you, you have to take them out. So, yes, so the motivation of this makes sense. Assume the people that have dogs have to, have to, have to support that piece. Because they want to do dogs on prescription study, I'm, I'm up for it. We could do one like <laughs> But yeah, with regards to public television, this is just one actually. I, I, in Australia, I had, I had a physiologist really fall out with me over my. I wrote an opinion piece in the um, of Clinical Oncology, basically saying effective, something like effective exercise promotion can survive is likely to be home based and involve oncologists. And some physiologists doing group based programs were up in arms about it. Um, I don't write things to you know deliberately upset people, but um, it's an interesting point. So I think the issue that with group based programs, some people get on well with them and they also they like that kind of approach. But the issue for me is they're not likely to be long term. So you can go and join a, a group program, but unless you know you just sort of love that kind of group atmosphere, I guess you're more extrovert, you're unlikely to carry it on. And most interventions, I think that's the problem with them, is they have a 12 week group program and then nothing. And people just think that, well, they've got fitter, they'll go just do their own, they'll go and find their own groups. But I don't think that's actually what happens. So it's more about how can we help people to do more exercise and keep it up? And that's really kind of where I, I, I come from with it. And um, yeah, without getting into a whole long yeah, Quick question. Um, well, it's really interesting. Yeah, so we did a study a few years ago with uh, health care questions with primary care. So you mentioned on the motivation of the drivers, one of the big things for GPs is you know, we've got a family, we've got so many appointments. So when we posed to them, can you told us how we can use our family members for activity? They all said, well, we're going to do something else, you know, so really throw home to us the motivation. And also, something also comes up is in guest and risk mitigation. Some people have not got themselves what to recommend. So you want to tell potentially a more sick people to be active. So I like the idea that you touched on the bit of having the heart rate monitor. Um, in that sort of with the other you know, serving with the oncologist and that, was there any insights there as to how or if they preferred having that data to sort of give them more I guess objective data to support people to be active? Do you mean for the patients or the Yeah, sorry for the patients, so could the oncologist with more confidence sort of prescribe yeah, I, I don't know that oncologists are not prescribing it on the grounds of safety. I think it's more that, well, A, they obviously are busy and it's just not on the top of it, it's just not on their radar. <laughs> um, so, and I think a lot of them, as we saw from that study, a lot of them just don't know what the guidelines are anyway. So, if you don't know what the guidelines are, I guess you're not going to be very confident about what, what to suggest. You might start saying they do like low intensity walking or that. They say things like, you know, stay active. But as we saw about erroneous views, stay active might, might, might just think, you know, not sitting it down too much, you know, but that's obviously not really being properly active. So yeah, it concerns me about this move away. I see a lot moving away, you know, more towards steps messaging and away from MVPA. As you must remember is, sorry, if I get to lecture, <laughs> I get a bit excited about this. So yeah, the guidelines, you know, are actually modest, vigorous intensity, but actually the, the, the best benefits in terms of CBD risk, they're doing three or four times that, you know, four, 600 minutes a week. So it worries me when we sort of think, oh no, you know, it's, it's a bit too much, let's focus on steps and light intensity. Uh, and that, that's kind of a trend I see kind of going forward. And I'm trying to fight against that and really just focus on MVPA primarily. No, so sorry, I should have maybe should put it up. So, so the guidelines, it's interesting again, it's the same again. Although we've seen my age group there for the trials were 60, 65, so an, an older age group, the guidelines are the same for cancer survivors they are for generally adults. So it's 150 minutes of moderate vigorous physical activity, it's aerobic, so it's aerobic exercise plus two sessions of strength training a week, so the whole body exercises. So 150 minutes is separate from strength training. Although obviously strength training could be at moderate, but I guess it's rare that you accumulate many minutes because obviously you rest and do a certain rest, so you don't probably accumulate many minutes of that. So it is here. So we were really pushing it. We did talk about strength training as well and 
help them to understand how they could do those kind of things at home. We really pushed the aerobic, because obviously it's the aerobic exercise has really been a be the thing that makes the difference between cancer recurrence and CBD risk. It's about the aerobic exercise. Shall I check if I've got anything on the chat? Or? <laughs> Not used to doing hybrid approaches. Is there, are there any intentions to span your previous studies to look at long term effects? Mm -hmm. um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we actually. Um, we actually measured quality of life um, in key parks. Um, but again, I'm, not, I'm swimming in data. So the next um, write-ups for, for key parks is the T3 data, um, and then the quality of life from T1, T2, T3, <coughs> then the HAPA data about whether the HAPA explains the exercise change between T1, T2, and T3, and then the process evaluation. So um, yeah, there's a lot of data to write up, and obviously I want to try and uh, apply for a larger funding to run that study um, with in a larger sort of more, defi more definitive trial. Yeah. Thanks. Move this up a little bit, a bit taller. Sarah? Sorry. Actually, I'll just move the, uh, the video up a little bit because I'm a little bit taller. Than I was, I think. Just look right. for most people. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, okay. Shall I make a start? Um, so, I suppose the first thing I've just noticed that I wanted to kind of mention that I'm really pleased to see is both on on Zoom, but also uh, in the room today, is student attendance as well, you know, spanning both undergrad, MSc, and PhD, I think that's absolutely fantastic. And that's really, you know, why this Spark seminar series is so useful, you know, to kind of really maximize that, that research community that we have, I think, within sport and physical activity research. Um, for those of you that haven't met me, I'm James Rumbold. I'm a senior lecturer in sport and exercise psychology, I'm just coming up to 10 years of being at Sheffield Hallam. Um, and most of my research to date has looked at organisational and occupational stress in elite and professional sports. Um, but I'm also particularly interested in looking at occupational stress in, in other vocations as well. Um, in terms of this presentation, this is a, essentially a paper that we've just submitted to a psychology journal. Um, and it's also something that we presented uh, at FEPSAC, which is the European Congress of, of Sports Psychology over the summer. So thanks very much to, to Girish and the Spark team for funding me to attend that and I uh, wanted to have the opportunity to present back to everyone in terms of the study and some general findings. But I'll also talk a little bit around uh, what I'm currently working on as well and hoping to, to work on in collaboration with colleagues uh, within the Health Research Institute going forward as well. So the title of this study, uh, it's very psychological stress focused in, in sport coaches and what we've done is an experience sampling methodology so we've used a diary study to look at fluctuations over a coaching week in terms of what we call primary appraisals I'll talk a little bit around what I mean by primary appraisals in a moment coaches perceptions of emotional exhaustion during that coaching week and their intentions to quit the job that they're currently doing or to leave their, their sport organization so in terms of this this research, there's both a practical and a research theoretical rationale uh, for doing this research. So from a practical point of view, just to give you a bit of context with some statistics, UK Coaching published a report in 2019 citing that over 300,000 coaches between 2017 and 2019 had left the profession. That's just the UK contingent, but actually if you have a look at some of the other statistics around the world, parts of Australia, um, that statistic is not necessarily getting any smaller. Um, more coaches are leaving the profession and also less coaches are starting up the profession. And recent research from qualitative uh, studies in sports psychology 
interviewing coaches on their experiences um, tends to indicate that one of the reasons for why coaches might be thinking about dropping out is because of their stress, their stress experience and the workload, the various stresses that they might encounter as part of doing those roles. So like a lot of other occupations, workload is typically one of the key things that the coaches find particularly stressful, but also every job often has some level of uniqueness to it. Um, coaching is one for anyone that has experience of coaching, you might know this that, or have experienced this, is that actually you might be juggling all sorts of things at home. You might actually be working full time as a coach, but you might also have another job role as well. So you might be juggling various job roles and also that kind of work life interface. And from cross-sectional research of a quantitative nature, looking at sport coaches' experiences of workload, the work-life interface, uh, and perceptions of organizational support, there's often uh, this relationship that is shown to be linked in terms of those variables and perceptions of emotional exhaustion and intentions to quit. But these are cross-sectional studies. So they're taking, handing out questionnaires or doing online surveys at one time shot in the season asking coaches about these particularly variables. So we thought actually, maybe there's something here, but we're also only getting a snapshot. So can we find ways to kind of, uh, to use Sarah's you know, term, to scale that up, you know, just that little bit more and see, can we see if that, these relationships possibly hold up if we look at fluctuations throughout a coaching week. And also a key element of uh, psychological stress from a range of different theoretical explanations is this idea of the demands that people might encounter and the resources that might be available to them. So I've just signposted you to a, a few theories and I won't talk about these in too much detail, but I did want to highlight this because um, within the workplace psychology literature, there are two common models that are often used to describe the way in which people might experience stress and in turn how that might lead to very positive because stress can sometimes be good for you to some degree, but also might be quite negative for well-being and performance outcomes. These models are what are called the job demand resources model and the demand control support model. And what they both have in common is very much the importance of personal and organizational resources to help people manage the demands that they might encounter in, in their work. So you can essentially have a high level of demands, but if you have the resources to actually manage that, then actually that could lead to feeling more engaged, performing better, uh, better productivity in your work. But often this sense of high demands, not feeling like you have the resources to cope is where you might see people experiencing things like emotional exhaustion, poorer health, more likelihood of wanting to, to drop out of, of the job that they're doing. One thing they don't directly examine these people's appraisal of those demands, their interaction with their environment, what that means for them personally in terms of their goals, where they want to get to in their jobs, and also their sense of well-being within, within those type of, type of jobs. So we're particularly interested in looking at the cognitive motivational relational theory because it very much places emphasis on what's called the primary appraisal. So this idea of how do we evaluate the workplace demands that we encounter in relation to our goals and our, our well-being. And it's seen as a really critical role in influencing the degree to which we might experience strain, greater productivity, um, greater happiness in, in the work that we might do. Now, a key theorist within this research is someone called Richard Lazarus, or the late Richard Lazarus, should I say. And one of the key elements of this theory is that Lazarus always argued that the situational context very much influences how we evaluate the environment that we encounter and how we may we try to cope. And to date in sports psychology research, there have been studies that I've kind of alluded to quite cross-sectional in nature that have looked at the coaching stress experience, um, but also perhaps haven't necessarily considered various situational contexts and also the degree to which they might appraise the environmental demands that they encounter as being stressful and possibly leading to, to poor, poor health. So as I said, there's a practical need for looking at this and also a research rationale as well. So what we wanted to try and do is we wanted to, to place greater emphasis on how coaches appraise the organizational events that they might encounter in a coaching week. And we don't wanna just look at these relationships in terms of four key primary appraisals, which are namely threat, 
challenge harm and benefit, benefit appraisals. We're also quite interested in this study of looking at how changes in those variables may be associated with changes in the perceptions coaches have about their emotional exhaustion, momentary emotional exhaustion, and their intentions to quit the jobs that they do. Just to say a little bit about each of these appraisals. So researchers tended to indicate that threat appraisals are often seen to be quite linked to uh, negative emotional uh, states, such as anxiety responses, for example. Challenge appraisals are often seen as uh, very much linked to that greater sense of mastery. So obviously challenge appraisal seen as something that's quite positive uh, in the work that you do. Benefit appraisals quite similarly seen as something that can develop kind of people's mastery and kind of progression towards achieving goals. Um, but also harm appraisals is, is often a, uh, a reflection on a way in which the stressful events that have been, you've encountered have somehow uh, damaged you in terms of your ability to work towards your goals or, or your well-being. So they have some similarities, but they have also been shown to have some links to, to health and well-being. But most of the research in sports psychology has been very qualitative and quite cross-sectional as well. So we wanted to look at this quantitatively. <laughs> And we wanted to almost, uh, if you like, as a pilot, is to look at these fluctuations throughout a coaching week. So we hypothesized with this study that changes in coaches' threat and harm appraisals would be positively related to people's perceptions of momentary exhaustion, which in turn would be linked to their, their turnover intentions. And we anticipated that both challenge and benefit appraisals would show a negative, an inverse relationship with perceptions of emotional exhaustion. So if you felt challenged or you felt that there was a greater sense of challenge throughout the week, you were probably less likely to feel emotionally exhausted in your coaching job. So how do we go about doing this? Well, first of all, as I said, we employed an experience sampling methodology. And just to say a little bit about, about that for those of you that are not familiar, it's also sometimes termed ecological momentary assessment so as an inter interchangeable term, if you like. And one of the rationales for doing this is that, particularly in sports psychology and other psychology studies, there are a number of studies that can be quite retrospective in nature. So we might conduct interviews, we might hand out questionnaires, and we might say, in the past month, can you tell us a time when you felt stressed? Or there are a number of sports psychology studies, without naming particular ones, where perhaps they've interviewed Olympic champions, and they've said, what were the key factors that led to success? And they've interviewed 60 year old people that won the Olympics when they were 22. Okay, so highly kind of uh, retrospective, you know, trying to recall things that might have happened 30 odd years ago. What ecological momentary assessment tries to do is tries to capture data as soon as possible to when it may have actually occurred. So the idea is that whether you're using personal digital assistance or mobile apps or paper and pen questionnaires, you're trying to get people to reflect on things that have happened in their coaching day within perhaps an hour of which it may have already happened. So what we started off by doing was we, we reached out to some, some coaches. The, um, I should have also put a shout out to my authors, co-authors, should I say, uh, Daniel Madigan at York St. John's University and Dr. Faye Didymus at Leeds <coughs> Beckett University. So we worked collaboratively on this one in terms of recruiting coaches, we used some of our contacts, but we also contacted elite and professional sports organisations around the UK uh, and asked them if they, uh, if they could advertise the study for us. Um, and what we were trying to do is we were trying to aim to get 80 coaches because we were conscious of trying to, to get um, daily data across five working days, a couple of times a week, a couple of times a day, should I say, uh, with the view to trying to achieve um, 800 degrees of freedom. So uh, for those of the statistics uh, experts in the room, that would kind of lead you to have a greater statistical power to, to be able to uh, estimate a desired effect for what you're hoping to try to achieve. So we had 74 coaches uh, that agreed to participate. Um, there's some demographic information there. So 62% of them were male. Coincidentally, 61% of them were full-time coaches and on average they were working 27.73 uh, hours a week so again it gives you a sense that even though 60 percent of them are full-time they're not necessarily working kind of 35 hours a week that might be because they're also juggling other other job roles 
on average, they've also been coaching for their current sport organizations for almost seven years. So what we used was a, a Qualtrics survey in this case. I'll come on to that a little bit later as well as a potential limitation. Um, we used the Qualtrics questionnaire to get some demographic background information to begin with, such as their sex. Uh, we didn't capture any data in terms of their names, um, but we did have some um, anonymous data that allowed us to then hand out uh, future Qualtrics surveys on a day-to-day -day basis. So once we had coaches complete a background questionnaire, the following week, we then sent them daily reminders to fill out a, uh, a daily uh, study um, data collection around their appraisals of coaching events that may have occurred in the past hour um, and the degree to which they experienced emotional exhaustion and their general perceptions of turnover intentions. Okay, for anyone that's watching this closely, you may have noticed that we're looking at hourly appraisals, momentary emotional exhaustion, and general turnover intentions. So the time frame is actually quite different. There's a reason for that because theoretically, an argument around the cognitive motivation, motivational relational theory would argue that people's appraisals will impact upon outcomes at a later date. So we're almost making this argument that how you feel or have you felt in the last hour might impact upon how you feel right now, which might impact upon how you generally feel in relation to turnover intentions. So in terms of the items that we used, we drew upon previous research literature uh, from both studies published in sports psychology, uh, looking at threat challenge, benefit and harm appraisals. Um, and we also lent on the organizational psychology literature in relation to indicators of emotional exhaustion and burnout, namely Diefendorf uh, and some of their work adapted from Maslach, who's one of the key burnout researchers uh, in psychology. In terms of how we analyze the data, um, in terms of collecting the data across five days a week, two time points per day, um, only 44 of the coaches completed data across the 10 time points. There was a fallout from, from the original 74. Um, and from that, we then conducted some um, path analysis using a structural equation model uh, with 337 observations. And I'm trying to talk through this in a practical sense, but this was the statistical model um, looking at within person, the individual person changes across a coaching week in their primary appraisals, their momentary emotional exhaustion, and their turnover intentions. And ultimately, what we found was probably partial support for original hypotheses. So going back to, to what I said earlier, we were hoping to see or expecting to see that threat and harm appraisals would be positively related to changes in momentary emotional exhaustion over time. What we found was that harm appraisals were very strongly associated and threat appraisals were going in the right direction, but not quite uh, statistically significant. Perhaps also uh, drawing upon previous research studies that have looked at appraisals in coaches over the previous few years. Again, as I said, most of them have been quite qualitative, but those that have been quantitative have often looked at the independent relationships of some of these primary appraisals. So I think what we're also seeing here, and you can see that from kind of the loops on the left hand side is that we're also factoring in the relationships between the various primary appraisals rather than just assessing their individual relationship with emotional exhaustion. So we think that's potentially affecting some of the, the relationships that we've, we've um, we found. So again, it's that classic, more research is needed, greater sample size, we might actually uh, find what we're expecting to see. So what? I guess, in terms of discussing the findings from an applied perspective um, and also a research perspective, it's originally in sports psychology in terms of um, not just reinforcing the importance of, of primary appraisals as part of a stress experience for coaches, um, but also it's using an experience sampling methodology, which offers that little bit more ecological validity rather than asking coaches to reflect on their time from uh, several weeks, several months, several years back. But we're very disappointed with the sample size. Um, we think one of the limitations related to that might be the Qualtrics approach as well. So accessing coaches remotely. 
Um, possibly another way in which we could have done this if we'd had some funding to support this might be the use of personal digital assistance or perhaps working with colleagues to develop some mobile apps in which we can collect the data. Yeah. Excuse you. <laughs> Maybe someone's keen on the mobile apps. Um, so one of the reasons that's important in the experience sampling methods is because you want to try and control things as much as possible. And one of those things might be um, facilitating time or event contingent approaches. So that essentially means when we've asked the coaches to fill this, these questions out, we've asked them to fill it out morning and afternoon. So in other words, twice a day, five days a week. But they could have filled that at any time in the morning and any time in the afternoon. If you have uh, mobile apps or personal digital assistance, what you're able to then schedule in is that they receive alerts at very specific times so you can control for various times of the day. So from a, from a fly perspective, um, really what I'd like to see where we go with this is actually um, providing some education back to the coaches. So uh, this is perhaps a shout out uh, to those on Zoom, but also in the room that are very interested in disseminating some of our coaching research within sports performance grade um, to coaches perhaps on compass. Okay, so we've got like a automated message or something like that. Someone's got the logo. Oh, I think it's Eskin. Uh, there we go. Sorry about that. We're all muted now. Um, so, yeah. Essentially, I think it's important we disseminate this back to coaches, not only in terms of um, getting a great sense of their stress experience, looking at other fluctuations throughout the year. So we've taken a snapshot of one week. Perhaps we need to look at various pinch points throughout, um, throughout the season for coaches uh, to see how it might fluctuate. And also, I think one thing that is a strength of this methodology, very similar to some of what Sarah's work is you know, talking about in terms of whether it's step count or some of those other factors, I think there is an element of improving people's awareness uh, of what they are actually thinking and feeling in that time. So I think there was also scope to develop some experience sampling methodology interventions where the intervention we're using is actually the diary method collection to see what difference that actually makes to coaches' stress experience. And just finally, I thought I should also just say a little bit around some other projects that I'm working on at the moment with colleagues at Sheffield Hallam, but also at other universities nationally and internationally. Uh, so James Newman is in the room with me. We've got a paper on the review at the moment, Sport Management Review, fingers crossed, um, looking at um, high performance and so national coaches' experiences of job crafting through organisational change. And what we mean by job crafting is how people adapt or adjust the demands and resources that they have within their work to make their job more meaningful and more engaged uh, for themselves. And they're also replicating a study with that to some degree, but on a much smaller sample, uh, working with the Dutch Football Association uh, and getting a sense of their experiences of, of job crafting and how that may or may not be linked to elements of, of burnout. Um, in the last year, I've also had uh, a small Seedcorn University funding pot of money uh, to look at um, infectious diseases, nurses' experiences of how they adapt their day-to-day -day work and how in turn that may be linked to, to burnout and musculoskeletal health. And we also did that during the pandemic as well. So it's how do they modify, how do they juggle their day-to-day -day work when actually resources might be quite low um, and they might be under a little bit of pressure dealing with patients um, who are receiving support with, with COVID-19. Finally, um, some future research grants around job crafting is something I'm very interested in, working with some of the pauper group, the AWRC, looking at how job crafting can work akin to, as an adjunct to, to workplace wellness programs. And I'm particularly interested in manual lifting jobs because these tend to be areas that affect clean musculoskeletal health. And there's a little bit of research that's been published um, in meta-analysis reviews in occupational psychology that indicate that job crafting may have some promise to actually reducing musculoskeletal health as well as a range of other psychological outcomes. And I'll wrap things up there for time. So thanks ever so much for listening. Okay. Hey.
those Zoom questions. Okay, so any more? Sorry, just to I think, uh, again, I'm going to draw on theory here, I think. In terms of threat appraisals, if you, if you think about when you feel threatened, generally, it's almost a more anticipatory feeling or perception, whereas harm is almost something that has already occurred. So I think if you're feeling emotionally exhaust, exhausted, it might make sense if you're already feeling harmed from you know, the workplace environment, if that makes sense. That's, that's kind of my explanation for it. And again, it maybe in turn, if you feel harmed, you maybe maybe already made an evaluation of what resources do I actually have available to cope with this. Um, and maybe the perception is, I don't have any resources, uh, which might make you feel more emotionally exhausted from perhaps trying. Yeah, that's okay. Just because that damage, isn't it? So it's, that damage is one of Right, thanks. Question. Thomas? Can, can you talk about the structure of motor for this We used, uh, if I understand you correctly, we used some statistical software, structural equation modeling software called M plus software, um, which is has a range of different structural equation methods that you can use. But what we've essentially done is we've run a path analysis model. So we've looked at the relationship between three variables. Um, we haven't run, for example, a measurement model. We haven't necessarily looked at kind of the indicators of all of the items for particular subscales uh, or anything like that. Does, it, does that help or am I not really tapped oh, into it? Yeah, so what we've, I suppose it's a little bit like a regression model where you're looking at the relationship between one variable and another, but what you're actually doing with this path analysis is you're essentially extending that. So you almost, uh, it's not quite looking at a mediation because what we haven't done is we haven't looked at how threat appraisals predict uh, turnover tensions over that, that coaching week. No, 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 maybe not. I don't understand either. Maybe it's, um, <laughs> so, it's, it's descriptive in the sense that we're not, it's not descriptive in the sense that we're just looking at means and standard deviations. We're looking at inferential statistics. So we're looking at beta values and we're looking at R squared. So that's a good point actually. So in terms of the impact of appraisals on emotional exhaustion, I can say that the, the R squared, so the amount of variance that we saw across that coaching week was about 20% that you could attribute to the changes over time in the week for, for primary appraisals in terms of threat, challenge, harm, and benefit appraisals. I'll ask the question, so I'll just ask more questions about the statistics than we generally study. No, I'm just uh, interested, James, where you, uh, where you go next with this. So mm. in terms of upscaling research, this is obviously a snapshot mm. in time. I mean, where, where do you take this next, I mean, in terms of a, a part of the study? Well, first of all, I think we've we've captured captured if that's the right word. We've collected data from coaches across a range of different sports organisations, and I think where we need to go next is going into specific sports organisations and collecting data from the coaches that reside within those organisations, because there's an argument in organisational stress management, which is is it the is stress the problem for the person or the work environment? And often the cheapest way to deal with that is to deliver kind of uh, employee assistance programs or stress management workshops or whatever, you know, health, health assessments and, and that sort of thing. But also the work environment might actually, you know, the organisation might have a role to play. So I think scaling this up, it's going into specific sporting organisations, um, ideally looking at this with a greater population of coaches where possible. 
um, and in turn trying to develop interventions specific to those, those sports organisations to show that some form of changes in their stress experience will actually make a difference to them wanting to stay in their, in their profession. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So then that's just Yes. <laughs> it's a simple answer. Yes, but I think at some point also um, these studies are useful for intervention development because you need to show that there's a problem that needs tackling first. You need to need to show that some of these relationships exist. You know that actually people are more likely to quit their job if they uh, if they feel threatened or if they appraise their their job uh, environment negatively. So I think it is absolutely scaling up replication. I'm always a big believer that replication is actually quite important um, before you before you develop interventions. But also it's probably going back into those organisations and saying, you know. This, this is what we this is what we're finding this is what we're showing so short answer was yes definitely Yeah. yeah so again from my research experience I've, I'm, I've had experience of doing both qualitative and quantitative I think you do have to know or have a good understanding of what works when and under what circumstances for whom so absolutely I think if you're going into sports organizations I do believe in mixed methods I do believe that you need to show from quantitative research that there is a problem but I think you also need to understand why as well to kind of feed into future interventions. I might have a question on the chat here, if that's all right. Okay, that's a statement from Girish. Yes, how many people have we got in the room? About 20? About 20 people, Girish? I think so. 30? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it's a good turn. I think it's been a really good turnout. And as I said before, I think it's great to see students, you know, at all, all levels, undergrad through to PhD here as well. So, so yeah, fantastic. Does that bring us to a wrap, Manus? Yeah. Great. I'll, I'll roll across and let you wrap up. <laughs> okay, well. I hope to see you again in three weeks' time. It was very good to have uh, students as well. And um, I'll find, I'll, I'll, I'll see if we can, um, in some of these presentations, you know, and this one obviously is ready made, but in most of these public uh, presentations can really develop into peer review articles. And we are looking forward to, to do this and help PhD students and members of staff to, to move in this direction if it is applicable. Uh, so I hope to see you again in three weeks' time. So thank you very much for coming.